Now you come to the next sutta, 4.20.196. On a certain occasion, the exalted one was staying near Vesali in great wood at peak roofed house. Now Salha the Lichavi and Abaya the Lichavi came to visit the exalted one, and on coming to him, saluted him and sat down at one side. So seated, Salha the Lichavi said this to the Exalted One, There are some recluses and Brahmins, Lord, who proclaim a twofold crossing of the flood, namely the way made by purity of morals and that made by self-mortification. What says the Exalted One about this, Lord? I do indeed say, Salha, that purity of morals is a factor of reclusion. Those recluses and Brahmins who uphold self-mortification, who make self-mortification essential, who remain clinging to self-mortification, they are incapable of crossing the flood. Moreover, Salha, those recluses and Brahmins who practice impurity of body, speech and mind, who live in impurity, they are incapable of knowledge and insight of the enlightenment that is unsurpassed. I'll just stop here for a moment. Uh. Here you see just now what I was saying about purity of body, speech and mind. The Buddha is saying here, uh, if you have impurity of body, speech and mind, uh, you are incapable of knowledge and insight uh, of the enlightenment that is unsurpassed. Then the Buddha said, Suppose a man, Salha, desirous of crossing a river, takes a sharp axe and enters the jungle. There he sees a mighty sal tree, straight up, crooked, uh, young, not of crooked growth. He cuts it down at the root. Having done so, he lops it at the top, and having lopped it at the top, clears off branches and twigs and makes it clean. Having done so, he chips it roughly with axes. Having chipped it with axes, he does so with knives. Having done that, he smooths it with a scraper. After that, he smooths it with a rock ball and then brings it down to the river. What do you think, Salha? Is that man capable of crossing the river? Not so, Lord. What is the cause of that? Why, Lord, that sal tree log, though well worked outside, is not cleaned out inside? This is to be expected of it. The log will sing. The man comes to misfortune and destruction. Well, Salha, just in the same way, those recluses and Brahmins who, who uphold self-mortification, who make self-mortification essential, who cling to self-mortification, are incapable of crossing the flood. Moreover, Salha, those recluses and Brahmins who practice impurity of body, speech and mind, who live in impurity, they are incapable of knowledge and insight of the enlightenment which is unsurpassed. But on the other hand, those recluses and Brahmins who do not these things but live purely are capable of knowledge and insight of the enlightenment which is unsurpassed. I'll just stop here for a while. The Buddha is giving an example eh, about a man trying to make a... A, 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 a boat eh, out of a log but uh, he carves the outside of the tree eh, he doesn't uh, work on the inside of a, of the tree eh. doesn't uh, doesn't carve the inside of the tree carves on the outside so similarly self-mortification eh, is working on the outside of the body torturing the body and that is not the spiritual path eh, not the Aryan path but purity of body, speech and mind uh, is purity of the three karmas and that is purity of intention because karma is intention. So purity of intention is purity of mind. So that is connected with the spiritual path. Uh. Uh, then the Buddha said, But suppose a man, Salha, desirous of crossing a river, takes a sharp axe and enters the jungle. There he sees a mighty sal tree trunk, etc. And after chipping it with knives, he takes a chisel and cleans out the inside till it is thoroughly hollowed out. Then he takes a scraper and scrapes it and smooths it with a rock ball. When he has done this, he makes a boat of it, fastens on oars and rudder, and finally brings down the boat to the river. What do you think, Salha? Is that man capable of crossing the river? Yes, he is, Lord. What is the cause of that? Why, Lord, that sal tree long is well worked outside and thoroughly cleaned out inside, made into a boat and fitted with oars and rudder. Rudder, this is to be expected of it. The boat will not sink and the man will reach the shore in safety. 
well Salha, just in the same way those recluses and Brahmins who are not upholders of self-mortification, who live not clinging to self-mortification, are capable of crossing the flood. And those recluses and Brahmins who practice utter purity in body, speech and mind, who live in utter purity, are capable of knowledge and insight, of the enlightenment which is unsurpassed. Stop here for a while. So here the Buddha is giving the simile of the man uh, who works on the log, uh, carves the inside of the log out, uh, cleans it and makes it into a boat. Then he can cross to the other bank. So in the same way, um, working on the purity of body, speech and mind uh, is uh, working on the purity of our uh, karmas, uh, and, and that means purity of our intentions, purity of our mind, and that is the spiritual path. Uh. So the Buddha continued, Just as Salha, a fighting man, because he knows many cunning feats of archery, is worthy of a Raja, is a possession of a Raja, is reckoned an asset to a Raja in three ways. What are the three? He is a far shooter, a shooter like lightning, a piercer of a huge object. Just as Salha, a fighting man is a far shooter, even so is the Aryan disciple possessed of right concentration. The Aryan disciple Salha, who possesses right concentration, Whatsoever object, be it past, future or present, personal or external to self, be it gross or subtle, mean or exalted, far or near, every object in short that he beholds, he looks upon it as it really is with right wisdom thus. This is not mine, this am I not. Not is this myself. Just as Salha, a fighting man is a shooter like lightning. Even so is the Aryan disciple possessed of right view. The Aryan disciple Salha, who possesses right view, understands it as it really is. This is Dukkha. This is the arising of Dukkha. This is the ending of Dukkha. This is the practice going to the ending of Dukkha. Just as Salha, a fighting man is a piercer of a huge object. Even so, the Aryan disciple is possessed of right Liberation. The Aryan disciple who possesses right liberation pierces through the huge mass of ignorance. That's the end of the sutta. Now this is one of the suttas where the Buddha uses the comparison of a fighting man to an Aryan disciple. And uh, in the first uh, comparison, the Buddha said that just as a fighting man is a far shooter, even so is the Aryan disciple possessed of right concentration. Because the Aryan disciple who possesses right concentration sees the five khandas, the five aggregates, or five grasp at aggregates, namely uh, body, a feeling, perception, volition, and consciousness. He sees these five aggregates as not mine, not I, not myself. In other words, he now these five these five aggregates are five things that all beings associate with the self. They take these five things to be the self or to be um to be um a possession of the self or um so um now, the, the person who possesses right concentration is able to see things as they really are, that these five aggregates are not self, not mine, not I, not myself. And so, this shows the importance of right concentration, uh, because only one with right, right concentration can see things as they really are. Now, right concentration in the Buddha's teachings, in the suttas, it's always defined as the four jhanas or one-pointedness of mind. Now, one-pointedness of mind is explained very clearly in Sutta, um, in the Sangyutta Nikaya, Sutta number 35.206, where the Buddha used the simile of six animals. And these six animals, when they are tied together, are uh, uh, the six animals are trying to take off in six different directions so that uh, at any one time, whichever one is strongest will pull the others. And when it becomes tired, and in, and in another moment, whichever one is strongest will pull and the, the other five will have to follow him. So this is um, supposed to be the everyday mind because uh, our 
the our six senses uh, there are six objects which impinge on our six senses on our six sense doors and whichever one is strongest will uh, pull our attention and then the buddha said um, that is not to the way to tame the six animals the way to tame the six animals is to uh, tie all the six animals around a huge a, a stout pole so that whichever direction they try to take off, they can only go round and round that pole so that eventually they become tired and weary and they lie down, uh, tamed uh, beside the pole. So in the same way, uh, uh, to tame the mind, we have to tie it to one stout pole, in other words, one object. And uh, whenever it is pulled away in a, in a different direction, we have to pull it back to that one object of uh, meditation so that eventually the mind becomes tamed and we attain one pointedness of mind. Now, um, putting our attention on different objects from moment to moment is just mindfulness, being mindful of the six sense doors. And mindfulness is the seventh factor of the Aryan Eightfold Path. Mindfulness is sati, uh, and that is attention, contemplation or putting our attention from object to object, a uh, different object to different object. Whereas uh, a right concentration or perfect concentration is putting our attention on one object uh, from moment to moment to moment, always on one object. And... Uh, and that is the way to get one pointedness of mind. So, um, uh, mindfulness and perfect concentration are different factors of the Aryan Eightfold Path, the seventh and the eighth factor, and they should not be confused. They are not the same. And um, uh, this is uh, very important that we bear this in mind because some people confuse uh, right concentration uh, with mindfulness. They think that concentration is uh, putting our attention from object to to different object from moment to moment. But this is clearly not so, as explained in the Sangyutta Nikaya 35.206. Now, the second comparison is just like the fighting man is a shooter like lightning, even so is the Aryan disciple possessed of right view, because the Aryan the, the disciple who possesses right view understands, as it really is, uh, the four Aryan truths about dukkha, uh, ill, or suffering. And so you can see that uh, a pers uh, the, the person with right view who understands the four uh, Aryan truths is an Arya. Uh, so, um, uh, right view is equivalent to being an Arya. And according to Anguttara Nikaya 2.11.9, there are only two conditions for attaining right view, uh, namely uh, listening to the teachings and having proper attention, yoniso manasikara. So, uh, from here you can uh, see that the way to attain right view and hence uh, stream entry is by listening to the suttas with proper attention. And there's another sutta which confirms this, namely Sangyutta Nikaya 46.4.8, where the Buddha said that when a person listens to the suttas or dhamma with proper attention, at that moment the five hindrances exist not, and the seven bojanga uh, factors of enlightenment go to completion. Now these uh, these two things, uh, the five hindrances not uh, uh, existing at that moment and the seven bojanga being uh, completed are the conditions for attaining aryahood. So, which means that uh, listening to the suttas with proper attention uh, is the way to attain stream entry. Again, in Anguttara Nikaya 3.85, the Buddha said the Suttapanna and the Sakadagami have perfect sila. There is no mention of concentration, which is necessary for the Anagami and the Arahan. So, again, uh, you see that uh, uh, concentration is not necessary for a uh, Sotapanna. And then in Sangyutta Nikaya 55.1.2, the Sotapanna has 
confidence in the Buddha Dharma and Sangha and he possesses pure sila or pure moral conduct. These are the characteristics of a stream enterer, a sotapanna. Then finally we see that in the um, uh, in the suttas and vinaya, uh, the persons who attain stream entry uh, always seem to uh, do so when they listen to the uh, suttas, just as we uh, have them today, just as we listen to them today. And uh, whenever the 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 Buddha uh, spoke the suttas, uh, some people seem to attain stream entry, even though they had not meditated before, even though they had not uh, listened to the Dhamma even uh, before. And uh, the Buddha called his disciples savakas. Savaka is a word, is a Pali word, which means uh, hearers or listeners. And uh, uh, that uh, all the disciples of the Buddha were listeners, hearers of his discourses, and uh, this shows again the importance of hearing the discourses because when his disciples uh, listen to the discourses, they attain unshakable faith in the Buddha. They they understood the suttas because they paid proper attention and they had the unshakable faith, and from there. They practice further the meditations, etc., and they attain higher levels of Aryahood. So this all shows the importance of uh, listening to the suttas as the very foundation in the spiritual path. And much learning is one of the factors, um, one of the important conditions in the in the spiritual uh, path. So. Um, Listening to the Buddha's uh, discourses is very much to be encouraged. Now we come to Sutta number 4.20.197. On a certain occasion, the Exalted One was staying near Savati at Jeta Grove in Anatta Pindika's Park. Now Malika, the Queen, came to visit the Exalted One and on coming to him saluted the exalted one and sat down at one side. As she sat thus, Malika the queen said this to the exalted one, Pray, Lord, what is the reason, what is the cause, why in this world some women folk are ill-favored, deformed, of a mean appearance, and are poor, having little of their own, of small possessions, and are of small account. I'll stop here for a while just to comment. Queen Malika is asking why some women are born with three characteristics. The first one is they are ugly. ugly. The second one, they are very poor. The third one, they are insignificant. That means they, are, they have no name, not well known. And uh, she asked again, Again, Lord, pray, what is the reason, what is the cause, why in this world some women folk are ill-favored, deformed, of a mean appearance, but yet wealthy, of great riches, of great possessions, and of great account? Again, Lord, pray, what is the reason, what is the cause, why in this world some women folk are well-favored, well-formed, lovely to look upon, amiable, possessed of the greatest beauty of complexion, and yet are poor, having little of their own, of small possessions, and are of small account. And yet again, Lord, pray, what is the reason, what is the cause, why in this world some women folk are well-favored, well-formed, lovely to look upon, amiable, possessed of the greatest beauty of complexion, and are moreover wealthy, of great riches, of great possessions, and of great account. I stop here again just to comment. Uh, here she is asking the different conditions um the the first one she she said as uh was uh, ugly poor and insignificant then the second case uh, ugly but wealthy and well known and the third case uh beautiful 
but poor and uh, insignificant. Then the last one, uh, women uh, are beautiful, wealthy, and of great account, well known. And then the Buddha answered, In this case, Malika, a certain woman is ill-tempered, of a very irritable nature. On very little provocation, she becomes cross and agitated. She is upset and becomes stubborn. She shows temper and ill will and displeasure. She is no giver of charity to recluse or Brahmin, nor gives food, drink, clothing, vehicle, flower, scent, ointment, bed, lodging or light. Moreover, she is jealous-minded. She is jealous of other folks' gain, of the honor, respect, reverence, homage and worship paid to them. She is revengeful and harbors a grudge. Such a one, if deceasing from that life, she comes back to this state of things, wherever she is reborn, is ill-favored, ill-formed, of a mean appearance, and poor, having little of her own, of small possessions, and is of small account. Stop here for a moment to explain. Here the Buddha is uh, giving the reason why a woman is uh, firstly ugly. And the reason a woman is ugly, the Buddha says, is because she's got a bad temper, very irritable, very easily becomes upset and uh, shows temper. And that's why she's born ugly. And then the reason, the second reason why she is poor is because she does not do charity, uh, does not do charity, so she becomes poor. And then the third uh, thing is uh, why the woman is born insignificant, not well known, is because she is jealous and revengeful and harbors a grudge. Uh, so these are the causes. Huh? And again the Buddha said, Herein again, Malika, a certain woman is ill-tempered of a very irritable nature. On very small provocation, she shows temper and ill will and displeasure. But she is a giver of charity to recluse and Brahmin. She gives bed, lodging and light, etc. However, she is not jealous-minded. She is not jealous of other folks' gain, of the honor, respect, reverence, homage and worship paid to them. She is not revengeful, nor does she harbor a grudge. Such a one, if on deceasing from that life, she comes back to this state of things. Wherever she is reborn, is ill-favored, ill-formed, of a mean appearance. But she is wealthy, of great riches, of great possessions, and is of great account. Stop here again to comment. Uh, here the Buddha is saying uh, the reason why a woman is ugly is because she is bad-tempered and she is rich because she is generous, charitable and well-known because she is not jealous, she is big-hearted. So because of that, when she comes back to this state of things, that means when she comes back as a human being, uh, she was, so these are the conditions why she is ugly, rich but well-known. Then again, the Buddha said, Herein again, Malika, a certain woman is not ill-tempered, not of a very irritable nature. Even on great provocation, she becomes not cross and agitated. She is not upset, does not become stubborn, does not show temper, ill-will and displeasure. Yet she is no giver of charity to recluse and Brahmin, nor does she give bed, lodging and light, etc., but she is jealous-minded. She is jealous of other folks' gain, of the honor, respect, reverence, homage, and worship paid to them. She is revengeful and harbors a grudge. Such a one, if deceasing from that life, she comes back to this state of things. Wherever she is reborn, is well-favored, well-formed, lovely to look upon, amiable, possessed of the greatest beauty of complexion. But she is poor, having little of her own, of small possessions, and is of little account. Herein again, Malika, a certain woman is neither ill-tempered nor of a very irritable nature. Even on great provocation, she becomes not cross and agitated. She is not upset, does not become stubborn, does not show ill-will and displeasure. Moreover, she is a giver of charity to recluse and Brahmin. She gives food, drink, clothing, vehicle, flowers, scent, ointment, bed, lodging and light. She is not jealous-minded. She is not jealous of other folks' gain, of the honor, respect, reverence, homage, and worship paid to them. 
She is not revengeful, nor does she harbor a grudge. Such a one, deceasing from that life and coming back to this state of things, wherever she is born, is well favored, well formed, lovely to look upon, amiable, possessed of the greatest beauty of complexion. She is wealthy, of great riches, of great possessions, and is of great account. Now, Malika, these are the reasons and causes why a certain woman is ill-favored, of mean appearance and poor, and of small account. Then, ill-favored, of mean appearance, but wealthy, of great account. Then, well-favored, beautiful, but poor, and of small account. Then, well-favored, beautiful, wealthy, and of, of great account. At these words, Queen Malika said this to the exalted one, Suppose, Lord, that I, in another birth, was ill-tempered of a very irritable nature, becoming cross and agitated, even on slight provocation, that I became upset thereat and stubborn, showed ill-will and displeasure, that same I might now be ill-favored, ill-formed, and of mean appearance. Suppose, Lord, that in another birth I give gifts of charity to recluse and brahmin, bed, lodging, and light, that same I now might be wealthy of great riches, of great possessions. Suppose, Lord, that in another birth I was not jealous-minded, I was not jealous of other folks' gain, nor of the honor, respect, reverence, homage, and worship paid to them. I was not revengeful, nor did I harbor a grudge. That same I am now of great account. Now again, Lord, in this Raja's family there are maids of the nobles, maids of the Brahmins, and of the householders too. Over them I hold supremacy. Lord, from this day forth, I will indeed become good-tempered, not irritable. Even on great provocation, I will not become upset nor stubborn. I will not show ill-will nor displeasure. I will give to recluse and brahmin food and drink, bed and lodging and light. I will not become jealous-minded. I will not be jealous of other folks' gain, nor of the honor, respect, reverence, homage and worship paid to them. I will not be revengeful, nor will I harbor a grudge. It is wonderful, Lord. It is marvelous, Lord. Lord, may the exalted one accept me as a lay disciple from this day forth, so long as life may last, as one who has gone to him for refuge. It's the end of the sutta. So you see, these are the conditions. Eh? If you are a woman and you want to be born beautiful, you must be good-tempered. If you want to be born rich, you must be generous, do a lot of charity. If you want to be well-known, like the Queen Malika, you must not be small-hearted, must not be jealous of others.